What up, everybody? Welcome to the X Cast. Right about now, we want to welcome you to the greatest podcast on earth. Hosted by yours truly, the XSP. I want to hear you say X Cast. Hello, everyone out there. It's time for another one. Yes, it's the X-Cast with yours truly, the XSP, and how I got a show for you today. I feel like VeggieTail is saying that, and we got a show for you. And that's true, right? But before we get to the show, I want to take care of a little bit of business. So if you like podcasts and you like uh, listening to people's story you like listening to different stories i want to suggest you along with my own uh, a burning hope podcast on spotify a burning hope it's conducted by renee torres a very good friend of mine and he's out there doing his thing a lot of great stories on that and also project restore which is hosted by jason garcia none other than my brother so if you like podcasts if you like interesting stories life-changing stories and i suggest you go and listen to those now if uh also if you like music if you like rap for like rock i can say i am a recording artist so if you would like to go peep out my music you can look at it all any streaming site under the xsp dash extreme street preacher with an x extreme starting with an x so if you like that please take a listen look on spotify follow whatever the case is not only that but if you like to donate just because you like this show i do it all for free but if you do like the show please send me a paypal uh you can you can donate through there whether it be a dollar two dollars anything counts especially during this time so without further ado i want to welcome uh a guest that i have who i've come to know and uh do through conversations and work and different things like that and we'll talk about that an, an american veteran and uh someone who's definitely a educator and an educated man um, goes by the name of tim bushacker so we'll get into that here in just a moment can you hear me yeah i'm here all right let me see your face oh <laughs> Yeah, that would be helpful. Here, this is weird on an iPhone. How about that? That's cool. Wonderful. There you go. Awesome. So, is it working that way? Yeah, that's good. Maybe you want to scoot scoot a little back from the from, scoot the phone back some. There you go. Oh, well, yeah, a little bit more. That's cool. All right, right there is good. Right, th right, perfect. Right there. Good. It All right. It doesn't change the orientation on your end. Uh, I, I looks good over here. Okay, good. Yeah, it looks good uh, on my end. So, man, I want to welcome you to the X Cast with the XSP. That's me. I'm I'm your host uh, for today. How are you doing today, man? Doing great. All right. So, I asked you on my show because I feel like you have a very unique perspective on life, and I feel like you have a very uh, decorated history as far as it comes to education life experience and i want to get to some of that and uh how we ended up uh in the same spot and how we share some very unique experiences as well so before we get into anything as far as history i want to know have you ever seen anything that you couldn't explain or something out of the ordinary in life or whatever the case is supernatural spiritual anything like that that you can talk about uh you know i i've never really had you know the ghost experiences or anything like that you know it's it's easy when you're a kid to be creeped out by something and feel like you've seen something or whatever but other than that no maybe once in the sky i saw something kind of strange but it could be explained as something man-made so i don't know i'm not one of those real ufo kind of guys or anything Right, so it looks like you come you come up based on logic, or you come up based in uh in science and education. So why don't you take us through maybe a little bit of your childhood, 
and uh, some of the upbringing that kind of shaped your mind, so to speak, to think in that way before you get into your education background? Okay. It was a, a, a Christian home. And uh, when I say Christian, uh, let me translate that to Lutheran, which is basically Catholic client. Okay. Uh, a lot of the things of the Lutheran church are very similar to the Catholic church. So a lot of the beliefs and teachings and things are, are very closely paralleled to each other. There are some differences, you know, the Lutheran church uh, does not believe in praying to the saints and the holy water and stuff like that. But um, uh, they do believe in, you know, infant baptism. They do believe in, um, you know, the, the minister being more or less like a priest. And some of the things that are recited in both churches are identical, i.e. the Nicene Creed. Uh, so it's not totally dissimilar from being Catholic, but if you ask a Catholic about a Lutheran, they would call us renegades. And then if you ask a Lutheran about Catholicism, uh, they'll say they've got it all wrong. So I don't know. All right, so uh, you're coming up in that kind of environment. What what caused you to go into the field of education? I'm sorry, I didn't even mention. I mentioned earlier you went into the field of biology, if I'm not correct. Uh, actually, at first, it was really electronics. When when I had first um, enlisted in the army, I was a uh, Nike Hercules computer and radar repairman, and I really liked and enjoyed electronics a lot in in my younger years and um then oh after about three years of that the army decided they were going to phase out that system and replace it with uh, the newer patriot system and um then i was faced with a, a choice i could either go into the patriot missile system or i could pick something different uh my military scores were high enough that i could pick just about anything that i wish to choose. I had at that time a secret security clearance, so I was not really limited that much on the choices that I wanted to make. And basically went down the list and looked and I said, huh, uh, looks like medical laboratory technician. Sounds like an interesting job. So I went to the school for it. Right. Real quick, real quick excuse me, to back up. Um, what what uh what caused you to join the military? Was that early on in life? Was that eighteen, or was that a uh, little later on? A little bit later on. I was twenty one. I had been in college for about a year and a half, and decided it was time to leave the nest and do something on my own. And the best way to do that without any money or any other means was to join the military. Uh, the army at that time had the shortest enlistment. Uh, that seemed to me like something I, I would like to do. I wouldn't commit myself for that long. <laughs> it's funny now since I retired from the Army. But uh, at the time, I was thinking three years is, you know, something good. and Get in there, get some money for education, and, um, you know, see a little bit. And basically, that's what I did. So at age 21, I left Texas for the first time in my life for – uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, to meet my new parents, Drill Sergeant Pease and Drill Sergeant Bone. And they were not kind. <laughs> was there a somewhat of a culture shock going into the Army at first? I mean, I know things were a lot different probably back then. I'm not, what year was that? Uh, you know, I'm not sure what year that was, but I'm sure things are a lot different now. But can you explain some of the, the when you first get there, the only thing I know of military is when I went to a, Christian boot camp and there were these guys with smoky hats and uh you know and they're waiting there and they get out and once we stop the bus they go in and start yelling and and get off the bus and let's go hurry up right now let's get it let's go kind of that kind of thing and uh so what, what was your experience when you first were when you first were enlisted enlisted in the army I, I pretty much already knew what to expect my, my father was a very stern man and he prepared me quite well for basic training told me basically what was going to happen uh so <laughs> for me it was it was hard not to laugh at the drill sergeants uh they they were being um 
as tough as they could be and as scary as they could be. And some of the guys were crying and it was, it was hilarious just to watch the chaos uh, that these gentlemen were able to create in the mind of many people there. Uh, sure, it was, it was scary and I did not want to be, my dad told me, he said, don't be first and don't be last. And that's, that was my credo when I was there. And I said, I don't want that drill sergeant to know my name. I'm going to do exactly what he says and I'm going to do it. Uh, these guys were loading up 45 caliber 1911 military style weapons. And they were saying, any of you guys try to want to go AWOL, we're going to shoot you and bear you out in the woods and all kinds of craziness. And guys were crying and everything else. And I'm sitting there trying to keep from laughing. So it looks like you were prepared. Do you think that something like that would fly nowadays uh, as far as that kind of, uh, we'll shoot you if you try to leave? Do you think that would fly today? <laughs> no, no, it, it's 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 a lot different back then. Back in the day, drill sergeants could hit you. Uh, drill sergeant knocked me out once, not totally knocked me out, but knocked me off my feet for doing something that I was, uh, for a direction that I was not following exactly as the drill sergeant said. and. Uh, with the fist, he hit me upside my helmet, knocked me off my feet. And uh, when I got up and dusted myself off, I did it right. And uh, that was the kind of attention that I did not want. And the drill sergeants, if you understand them, they weren't trying to be mean. They were trying to create a chaos in your mind. They wanted you to wash out in basic training. They didn't want you to wash out in a combat situation. They had a real strong idea of how they wanted to train people. They didn't want them to break in combat. They wanted them to break in basic training. And obviously there, there's a great difference between the two, but what the drill sergeants would attempt to do was create as much chaos and as much fear and confusion in your mind as they could and watch your reactions to that. So it's really more kind of a, a tough love, if you will, or a, uh, you know, I don't want you to die on me while we're actually in battle. I'd rather you come close to it here when I can help you or when you're right. not, um, <clears throat> when, you know, while we can all kind of band together, not when we're out there kind of bombs are flying and whatnot exactly and a lot of guys didn't make it you know a good 20 people that we started with washed out they cried they said they couldn't take it they couldn't do this they couldn't do that but that was their test in fire if you would you know if you can't take basic training you're not going to be able to handle a combat situation at all and combat is not pretty, it's not fair, it's not easy. And the drill sergeants at that time would create a very unusual, stressful situation in hopes to break you there, if that's what you were going to do. Was there ever a time where you said, hey, this, this is not right for me, or this is not something that, that this is not what I was looking forward to, or was there ever a time where you're like, nah, I, I, I got to get away from this? Or a time where you're questioning uh, the, whether you should have joined the military or not? Oh, definitely. And that's what basic training is all about there. When you, when you come in and your barracks is turned upside down for the 20th time in the same week because one person didn't have their socks rolled in a certain direction or whatever, yeah, you get frustrated and you get angry and you get tired. Uh, there was a time where we were up for 72 hours with very little sleep. And, um, but that was all designed to create a simulated stress, if you would, to see if you're gonna break there. Yeah, it's no fun. It was no fun by any means at all. It's a lot more fun now to look back and talk about it. But even football players, if they talk about how the coach put them through two-a-days and things and how their bodies ached and, and how much they had to push, 
I am sure at that time they did not like their coaches. Okay. And the same thing with your drill sergeant. You don't like them either. When when they're cursing at you and hitting you and and everything that they do to you to try to make you break, you're going like at some point you go like, Oh God, you know, when is this gonna end? And then comes the gas chamber where they throw you in with uh uh, tear gas and you have to take the mask off and that was uh, absolutely the most horrible time I've ever had in my life. Would it be safe to say that all that uh, happening or all that you went through shaped pretty much the rest of your life and how you would carry it, how you would handle different situations? Yeah, it, it made you grow up. It Once you graduate from something like that once you make it through a trial if you would let's just call it a trial once you make it through that if you're a human you have learned something in that trial by fire and it makes you a better person in the end you're you're not scared of so many things anymore you're more confident of things you have learned a new lifestyle, you have learned a new attitude. And um, that's a lot of, of the basic training is to teach you a new attitude. The, the old saying was, there's the right way and there's the wrong way and there's the army way. And there's a lot of truth to that. And um, you can look at that kind of thinking and everything, you know, there's the right way and the wrong way. And, and there's the way that God wants us to go, you know? And uh, so it's, it's kind of like that too. You know, we, we go through this basic training here on earth we call life. And a lot of times it's the same sort of thing. If you equate the two, there's really no difference. The only difference in basic training was it was a little more physically and mentally straining than what you would find in normal civilian life all right let's fast forward a little bit you're in the army you're past basic training you said you have the opportunity to go to a different type of study and you pick biology right that, all right so tell us the mindset um that you came in with or that you that you kind of developed at that time and you start to dive into something that you basically were thrown into but before we get to that tell us about your biology study and what you kind of learned uh within that that study or how did it change your perception maybe towards human life uh, uh biology once you once you look into a microscope and once you see the elements of each particular human cell once you have taken histology classes mycology classes and all the stuff and you see how all the components of the body all fit together, how the body, human body fits together as a complete unit. Uh, there's only one conclusion, I think, that, that you logically can come to at this point. And that is that there is a divine creator that put this all together. There's no way that a human body with all its complexities and cycles and I'm not even talking about the thought process of the brain yet. I'm just talking about biological functions. If you look at that alone, there's no way Darwin could be right or anything else. This is much too complex to have happened by chance. To me, it feels like it goes back to the proverb, a fool in the heart says that there is no God. So you're going through this. Was there ever a time where you doubted that, that, uh, that, there was a God or there was some kind of divine presence and it kind of changed your attitude or changed your outlook once you started diving into this, uh, this study? Uh, I think the most difficult time was, was um, having to do autopsies on, on humans and things. And there were some very sad circumstances that you come in contact with when you start dealing with the dead like that. And uh, some of those situations were extremely difficult to understand, especially the children. 
and I've had a number of children that I've had to do autopsies on. It was very difficult to separate the fact that I was doing a biological medical procedure on this deceased individual and try to leave the human element out of it. It was extremely difficult. I had to do things like covering faces and stuff so I would not see their face uh, so that I would just look at the biological part of it and not what I perceive to be the human part or the face. Right, so you, you jumped right into what I was going to go into next. You start doing autopsies. What was the first, uh, what was your first um, uh, impression or what was your first reaction upon, now this is not something people normally do on a regular basis, sli slicing basically into a human body. What was your reaction? What was the, the first thought that came to your mind? Was there a thought of this is too much or... How did you end up getting into that field and then your first um, your first time you had to actually split open a human body and really and you actually have to handle the uh, the organs and what was your first experience like with that oh just just as, a, as hold on just as a as a a, a, a disclaimer we're about <laughs> to get very graphic and um, if that, that's too much for you to stomach just hang on for us it's all for research purposes and this is for to let somebody know that there is a, a creator out there that created you very carefully. And as the Bible says, uh, uh, I, I fashioned you in your womb. Uh, 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 and so this is not to be grotesque or to be morbid. This is for, so you can understand that through, through even through science, you can realize that there is a hand of the divine in, involved. So take us into that, that moment. Okay. Well, being in the Army, uh, I wasn't really given a choice whether I wanted to do an autopsy or not. I was basically ordered to do an autopsy. Uh, but uh, my commander, Dr. Gary S. Sisler, a, uh, a colonel, a U.S. Army doctor, uh, was very skilled in manipulating people into getting them to do things that you didn't think you were possible to even do. And uh, it was very interesting <laughs> because Dr. Sisler was a Buddhist. He believed Buddhist principles and beliefs, uh, but it was, um, it was interesting the way that he, I'm gonna say he manipulated uh, me into doing it. And I don't want to really say manipulated so much as to give me a different mindset on how to deal with it. And I did. Once I opened up my mind to what this procedure was, I was really not really afraid of the dead body at that point. I saw it as an empty biological shell that I had to assist in to find out why this biological machine failed. And uh, so basically that's what an autopsy is, is to go inside and to explore everything and to find out why someone uh, was no longer with us at that point. But um, I was able to somehow, through the help of God and Dr. Sisler, okay, both of them together. So I, I'm assuming that, that God had a hand in that in helping me overcome my fear of death and mortality and um, was able to, with some degree of ease, be able to do what it is that I did because it's not natural. It is not natural to, to take everything out of a human body and examine it, weigh it, photograph it, slice it up, and then just uh, throw it back inside the human cavity and uh, turn it over to the funeral director. 
what was your your first reaction upon actually making the i believe it's a y incision is that how it's done or can you take us through some of the process and uh what you saw um as far as when you were removing organs and whatnot what were some of the things that that struck you as like whoa this is this is uh this is not by chance or this human body is not put together by chance can you take us through some of that in the procedures I, I think, you know, seeing um, the heart and the lungs and the organs like that, um, not so much. You know, I, I had been hunting in, in my youth, so gutting a deer was, or an animal that we had shot, was it was very similar to it. The smells were different and things like that, but that wasn't really so fascinating. But the first time that I saw a human brain removed from a body uh, that was a game changer uh, that's totally different when you realize how the brain functions in life what uh, what what was it about the brain that that really tipped off that kind of thought was it uh the the fact that it was maybe just a mass of flesh or or whatever it's made of i'm not sure but uh, what was it that, that really kind of just like kind of went off in your mind as far as when you were holding a brain for the first time? It's, um, yeah, you just, you wonder because you think about your own brain inside your head, a living brain, when you're holding a dead brain and you're looking at it and you go like, well, at one point, you know, was this where, the soul resides is this what made that person that person and not somebody else uh, there's so many things to it because the psychological aspect versus the biological functions of the brain are two totally different critters and it's hard to understand when you're holding a dead brain in your hands um, what the spiritual or psychological aspects of that brain were at that point you know you were looking just at the biological functions and that alone is mind-boggling i mean the way that our ears function uh, sound waves converted to electrical impulses and we don't have a battery anything like that but the human bo body you know generates an electricity if you would uh, the nerves fire electrical impulses across, and that's what continues to make our heart beat and what allows us to see and hear and speak and everything are all nerves, all connected to the brain. And uh, if you start thinking of just the biological functions and not even the spiritual functions of the brain, it's just mind boggling how. It does what it does. When we sleep at night, we continue to breathe and our heart continues to beat without effort. We don't even think of it. We don't have to think of it. Uh, the brain takes care of all of that for us, whether we're asleep or we're awake or if we're unconscious. Just the thought of that, and it's, like I said, it just boggles my mind, even though I, I have somewhat of an understanding of that. And you're, while you're while your body sleeps and rests, your brain continues to stay active. So it never shuts off, basically. And that's, that's a, you look at any other, um, anything made and, and that uses electricity, once you shut the power off, it goes off. So, you know, uh, to, that's a complicated thing to do uh, as far as like function wise that, your brain doesn't shut off your body does but your brain doesn't but at the same time it continues to move as we rest which kind of makes your head spin a little bit when you when you say it like that and that's one of the things that uh has always boggled my mind about uh about our brain or just about brain work in general is that your brain has multi-functions but once it's once that thing is cut off it kind of that's where everything else goes as well it looks like the the spirit the soul whatever you like to call it is it's kind of within that but it's not at the same time so is that some of the things that you kind of pondered maybe after a long night of, of autopsy that you lie awake in bed or 
you know, think of those things. And I know you're, you're still in the army setting. So maybe that might, might be the first thing, but maybe in hindsight, you think that you had a, a moment where you're like, Whoa, this is, this is beyond me or this is beyond like earthly kind of uh, work. You, you can't do any kind of biological work of any kind. You can't look at a microscope and come out with anything other than wonder of the engineering that is there. Uh, to, to say that that was chance, I, I don't see how it is. How some explosion in the cosmos suddenly caused everything to fall in the right place at the right time and start this thing we call life no it's it's much too complex it would take trillions upon trillions and trillions of years for something like that to even come close to evolving and even then i don't think it would get much more than an amoeba yeah, that's, that. that's an amazing yeah, it's an amazing uh perspective to have especially hands-on um so we're gonna stay within this topic so to speak a little a little before we transition um was there ever a time that uh, as you were uh doing these or is there ever a time that just disturbed you disturbed you where you felt like man i just can't do this anymore yeah the children and uh and i had to do an autopsy on a nine-year-old boy well i didn't do the autopsy assisted on that autopsy on a nine-year-old boy uh, that was uh, shot by his stepfather with 12 gauge shotgun in the head. That was a little hard to deal with, to say the least. And, you know, um, I don't think you can be human and not come out of that with some kind of, without some kind of mark on your psyche, if you would, from something like that. And it took me a while to get over that. I mean, there was some times after that autopsy that I would wake up in a covered in sweat and uh, not feeling right, not understanding how I was feeling uh, because I didn't really see that as a post-traumatic type shock. I wasn't being shot at. Nothing was going on. It was in a nice, quiet, cool morgue. There wasn't any real distractions, anything other than uh, the body of this nine-year-old boy laying there with, uh, uh, who was, had part of his head missing from the shot from a 12-gauge shotgun. So, all right, so that, uh, obviously that can do something, like you said, and even just hearing it is disturbing. Now, seeing it, I'm sure, would definitely do, uh, like, sear an image in your mind. So let's let's move past that. Obviously, you you do your time in the the military. What's your next move as far as going out into the civilian world, or what 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 do you uh, where where do you transition into being a sheriff in Los Angeles County? I I basically did the uh, the stint as a reserve deputy in Los Angeles County uh, just to have something do on to do on the weekends. So I guess you could kind of say it was a uh, thrill seeking moment you know some people want to do rock climbing some people want to do uh skiing or skydiving or something like that for me it was exciting uh putting on a vest and a gun and a badge and going out and uh doing something with the full-time deputies that was inherently dangerous and uh, yet at the same time extremely challenging so as if your job wasn't exciting enough, you went into being a deputy, excuse me, deputy at Los Angeles County, which is known for, at the time, I'm, uh, I'm sure, for riots and different things of that nature. Did you ever encounter any of that kind of uh, domestic disputes, domestic unrest in your time uh, in Los Angeles County? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we had uh, domestic calls and things like that. Uh, but thank God that um, my partner and myself were extremely in tune to each other. Uh, we had a situation where we had a domestic dispute, and for some reason unknown to me, they 
put the suspect in the garage. And that was kind of a bad move to start off with. And I could ease or I could sense rather the, uh, the tension from my partner, but I don't know why he didn't attempt to move the guy out of the garage. But then um, our suspect then, while two of us had him in the garage, started to go toward a knife. I saw it and looked at it, just glancing at it. My partner saw me looking at it. And basically all we did to quell his desire to pick up that knife was step between him and the knife. He didn't want to pick on two full grown men. He would rather beat up his wife and assault her with a knife, but he wasn't gonna do that to two full grown deputies. All right, so did, was there any other cases, like were you there during the, uh, the riots during that time? Uh, tell yeah. us a bit about your experience with some of the kind of dealing with angry crowds, things like that. Uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting because you have to understand that the same time that I was a reserve deputy sheriff, I was still a uh, full time regular army soldier. And during the time of the riots, uh, our particular office was right in the middle of South Central Los Angeles, right in the middle of the riots. They called us in because our building or part of it had been torched and we had sensitive documents in there that we needed to get out of that building uh, to make sure that nobody had, nobody else had access to them. Uh, so we had to go in and we were not given weapons and um, there were literally hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of people roaming the street right across the street from our building that uh, the federal government had leased for our function with the uh, department of defense and yeah that was uh, that was a bit scary being in there without a weapon of any kind uh, we basically just made them believe that we were armed and um, they didn't mess with us. I don't know why. Thank God they didn't. <laughs> were there other times where even then you felt like your life was in danger or um, anything like that that you can, you can let us in on or kind of, because I know sometimes right now when it comes to the, uh, you know, the local police station or, local law enforcement there's kind of a, a a stigma that they don't really do their job or they don't really uh, they're not really out to protect the people was there ever a time where you put your life in danger for somebody else um i mean just the fact that you had a uniform and a badge on was was pretty much it it was like painting a huge target on your body and going outside and saying shoot me please um you know, you you rely on your training, uh, you rely on your equipment, uh, you rely on your partners, and um, you just do what you need to do. Now, understand, like, during the riots, the, the 1992 riots were caused by basically the Los Angeles Police Department's uh, handling of the Rodney King case. Now, if that would have been Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies handling that, uh, our training was totally different than what the Los Angeles Police Department's training was. We would not have ever allowed it to get to that point because our training was different. We did things differently. Uh, Rodney King would have been rushed by a number of deputies. He would have been basically hogtied and thrown in the back of the car and carted off to central jail. And there would be very little to show on a video. Now, with all that said, the Los Angeles Police Department at that time probably handled Rodney King in the manner to which they were trained. And it's, it's hard to understand that when you're watching that video because you're watching what the two or three Los Angeles Police Department officers wail on this guy with the, um, P24 nightsticks and they're wearing this guy out. 
But what you have to understand at that time, tasers were very new to the police departments. And Rodney King was wearing a very heavy leather jacket at the time. So at that time, the barbs on the tasers were not as long and the charge to fire the barbs from the taser were not as powerful. They never penetrated his coat. So when the police officer from Los Angeles County pushed the button on the taser, Rodney King did not react. Now, typically, if you know you have a good connection with a taser and you hit somebody with a taser like that, that typically means that they're on PCP. So they thought in their mind or in their training that Rodney King was on PCP. That's why he was not reacting to their uh, orders to lay down and why the taser did not work. Uh, <clears throat> the beating, yeah, well, that was a bit much, okay? Uh, but it had to do with the training that they were given at that time. Now, a lot of things have changed since then. But, um, you know, it doesn't look good on video what those officers did. And it creates a stigma with the community, particularly the African-American community, uh, that police officers are just out to beat down black folks. And that's not what really happened there. All right, let's transition. You, you, you did your time there in L.A. County. How did you end up at the uh, Juvenile Detention Center in Texas? We'll just leave the county uh, out of there just for, just, you know, for protection's sake. But I think if people know who you are personally, we'll know where we were. Uh, so <laughs> how, did, uh, how did you end up? Uh, you're, you're staying in kind of the law enforcement kind of uh, mold, and you end up in the Juvenile Detention Center. How did you end up there, or what what caused the uh, change in in uh, in careers? You know, I, I thought maybe I could uh, I could do something with the youth there. I thought maybe that um, you know I could be an example or whatever. But um, <clears throat> uh, a lot of those kids there, um, they're they're kind of career villains, if you would, and a lot of them didn't, but there were a couple of them I feel like I really touched. You know, I was able to talk to them and stuff like that, and that made me feel good. Now, when you're in a, a situation like that, it's, you, you know straight up that you're not gonna be able to reach everybody, and there's gonna be a small percentage that will actually learn something from what you have to say. And, and I think I accomplished that there. I think there was one or two uh, that, that actually listened. I think that hopefully, I'll never know, hopefully it made a little difference in their life. I know that um, the thought of a perpetual villain or a career villain kind of seems negative in a way. But to those who are listening out there, if you've never worked in the juvenile setting, kids are hard hit. Kids are hard headed. Some of them are knuckleheads, and um, you know some of them do things just so that they can come into there to have a place to stay. But when you see them over and over and over again uh, doing the same thing, after you say, "Hey, it's gonna end up here. It's gonna end you up here," you end up going further out somewhere else where you don't want to be. It kind of takes a toll on the person who's actually working there. Because it's like telling somebody, hey, don't do that. It's going to burn you. Don't touch that. It's going to burn you. They get burned, and they go and do it again. And you tell them again, and they get burned. And you go, don't you, don't you get it? Like, don't you see what's going on here? You're going to hurt yourself. And that's kind of the, the thought process. Man, they just, it's just not, it's not hitting. It's not hitting into their, their, their heads, or it's not getting into their, their thought process that, hey, you know, look at what you're doing. Yeah, there are some that, um. You know, they go in there and they're really just looking for a place to stay because their parents don't love them. Or maybe the, the, the I know I've had where a kid confided in me one time and he goes, 
look, I have sisters. Uh, you know, I live with my mom. My mom is always telling me I look like my dad and she doesn't want to see me. I don't necessarily do things to get on her nerves, but this is the only place I know that I can have a bed and I'm going to be safe and I'm going to have food. So that kind of thing comes out. And it, as a person who's trying to make a difference, you can't control somebody else's life outside of the, 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 the facility. So it takes its toll on you and you kind of start to just, you're going with the motions or you're like, Hey man, I'm just either I'm, I have to get out or I need a change. I need a break or something. And I'm sure that's kind of the, some of the similar things that you go through as well. Uh, definitely. I mean, you hear some of the horrors, horror stories of things like uh, one of the horror stories that I heard when I was at uh, Chaos County Juvenile was that one of the children who was an inmate there was a test used by his father who made meth and would try it on his kids first before he sold it to his clients. And if it didn't kill his kids, then he would sell it to his clients, which was, you can't understand what kind of environment that some of these kids must have been and live in and what kind of filth and evil people that they have to deal with their parents in some cases right and uh, that's not even a first i've heard that i've heard that firsthand uh working there is it for whatever reason where uh, different parts of texas meth is a huge thing and and um these these people they they create it in their in their homes and they're they're testing it on their family members some of them their young children their children get hooked on uh, you know, on these drugs early on in their life and in their teenage years, their brain is so fried that they could, they're so impressionable that they just do whatever, whoever tells them to do. And oftentimes gets them caught up in the law and the system of the, uh, of the, of, uh, the correctional system. And it's just kind of sad. And that does take its toll on you after a while. It, it does. When, when you couple what you know, in situations like that and in my case understanding that drugs like that like methamphetamines or whatever or even as as simple as just marijuana what that can do to a juvenile brain uh, a, a brain that is developing and you know I, I just uh, I wouldn't want to be those parents on judgment day. You know, that whole millstone thing and cast into the lake kind of comes into my mind that there's going to be a whole lot of parents uh, finding themselves on the bottom of that lake with a millstone around their neck uh, because of what they did to their children and what you and I both witnessed uh, at Hayes County in some cases. Right on. Uh, so, how did, how did you end up to be a part of what we would call a crossroads or you could call it a after high school type um, thing with, with special needs children? So that's really uh, the, one of the main reasons I want to get to. But I wanted to show how colorful your, your past is before entering even into the educational field. Uh, how did you end up working with special needs students and how does that even change your perspective even more in life? Um, first off, I, I really enjoy working more with special needs than I do with Gen Ed. Uh, special needs kids, um, it's a lot more rewarding. Uh, the Gen Ed kids, it, it's like, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I'd be in a class and trying to teach them something, and, and they just want to be a smart aleck and, and pop off to you and all this stuff and everything like that. You don't find that that much in special ed. When you're working with these kids, they appreciate you more. And being genuine and open with special ed is a lot easier than it is in gen ed. Uh, in general education classes, I don't feel like you can really be yourself. You gotta, you gotta put on some kind of bravado or whatever. With special ed kids, you don't have to do that. 
you can just be yourself. If, if they realize that you're being genuine, then they accept you a lot quicker than, than a, than a gen ed kid would. It's just, you know, the whole thing getting in the crossroads was, was kind of a, a chance, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, it was, um, I didn't, it just happened to get there because one of the, uh, instructors over there was uh was sick for an extended period of time and i just happened to be there and was able to connect with a lot of those kids and i found it easy to and i don't know why maybe it was um you know i i realized maybe that these guys are a little bit more vulnerable and i like being that that big brother kind of thing you know uh taking care of, of the weaker ones, if you would. And, and I, I kind of do that with, with them. So I, I put on a fatherly or a big brother kind of uh, attitude that I feel comfortable with. And it seems to work very well with the special ed kids. And uh, just for those who don't know, what, what exactly is Crossroads or what, what does it all entail? Uh, it's part of special education, but can you give a little bit of insight on what what you do in the community or um, what you do in as far as teaching wise? What is it exactly that you teach them? You're basically just being a mentor. You're being an adult. You're you're taking them out into situations, and it's it's nothing real complicated. You know, you would take them to um, to embassy suites, for example, and they would clean off tables and sweep floors and things like that. And you're teaching them how to be productive. You're modeling for them. You're talking to them. You're encouraging them and, and taking time with them. And uh, it, was, it was just a great thing. You know, these guys wanted to be able to do something. They want to be somewhat productive in society i think i really think they have a desire to do that they want to be able to work and i think that's part of human nature i think people really want to do something some kind of work of some kind sure uh, uh, that definitely makes a lot of sense and i've been out of work for well, obviously, collectively, both of us, we've been out of work for a few months now, and and I don't know about you, but I've been I've been in situations where I haven't worked for eight months, and I feel like almost to be to be super honest, like worthless. Or if you can't contribute to, you know, society, you can't contribute to your family. You kind of have a, a a lack of self worth, and I think that uh, programs like Crossroads really help give those kids dignity, especially since most uh, society looks down on them as if they don't understand or and that was one of the things that uh i know when i first entered in the special education uh i had this kind of idea of man well, i'm gonna have all these kids who are acting all wild and you know flinging their arms around and just it'll be like a circus atmosphere but little did i know that when i entered in i was like man these kids are super accepting they understand concepts although some of it may take a little longer to get you know they they do understand every little thing that that um that any other kid understands it takes them a little bit longer to grasp it but they do understand they're not devoid of understanding is that the exactly. kind of the same situation you had yeah exactly on that um i i think the ones that that are the most surprising uh to work with even though i i don't know if i would have enough patience to work with some of the nonverbal students that we have in our classes um, because I'm, I'm just so used to working with the verbal students, but I've watched some of the other teachers in the other rooms, uh, work with these nonverbal students. And you would go like, what could this person really know? And it's amazing how much they do know. And, um, but the thing about special ed is we're we're measuring in millimeters and 
for me, that makes sense. Coming from a medical point of view, everything that I'd ever done in the past and everything was measured in millimeters and microns and so forth. So transitioning from biological type work into educational work and dealing with minuscule things like, oh, we're, we're not changing all this about this kid, but what we did is he's no longer doing this behavior or that behavior, you know, can be a very big thing for, for some of these guys. Awesome. After transitioning from Crossroads, you, you are put in a situation where you have a partner, myself. <laughs> so from, from, from my perspective or from my end, uh, I was put with a, with a student who was prone to um, outbursts, prone to meltdowns, and had a reputation that another, another one of my coworkers said, basically, I can't handle this, basically. And props to him if, if he's out there listening for lasting as long as he did. But I can understand how, you know, someone cutting themselves and putting blood on a paper and saying, you're next, uh, can make somebody shy away. Um, I, I was brought up in a, in a, in a broken home. I've seen a lot of violence in my life. Uh, I've done many things that were violent. So things like that, not like that, but I've worked with very violent, uh, individuals before like yourself. And, um, so it just so happened that we were put together and, uh, uh, things started to kind of move from there. How, how much of a transition was it from crossroads to being one-on-one -on -one with this individual? Was there any different kind of mindset going in or did you have kind of the same uh the same kind of outlook as far as going into this new project you know i, I really i don't know if i really changed my outlook or anything like that um I, I i really felt like i had a confidence that you and i together could do this thing especially when i learned about your background and then seeing and praying about this student i think had a huge impact instead of letting him control staff we were controlling him and we were modeling him by not reacting to all this bizarre behavior that basically kind of unnerved other individuals in which i can understand but once you have been through a background in corrections and or military and or law enforcement or whatever um, things don't seem to bother us as much you know we were not rattled as easily you know um, hence you know drill sergeants screaming at me and stuff like that it was like i'd been there and there's no way this student's going to come even close to that and uh, there was nothing that he could do that I was afraid of. Yeah, that's one of the things that we both share is kind of a fearlessness, not so much coming from uh, coming from just ourselves, but maybe what we believe in. Uh, not only that, but you being in the military, you've seen a whole lot more than I have. But also myself, just being in the middle of a uh, domestic violence from the age of eight to. I mean, who, and not, I mean, not, to, not like maybe 12 years ago uh, or actually 13 years ago. So I definitely was one who was not prone to violence or maybe at one time I was, but I've seen it. And then now I'm working at the uh, juvenile detention center. My first day was, you know, they have isolation cells and there's a girl who's cutting up her arms with her own fingernails and there's blood streaming down both arms. And, um, you know, okay, well, here, here you go. This is who you're working with. And kind of, kind of not not having to, uh, you know, not not breaking in front of anybody, and you want to make sure you keep face, and that kind of just becomes second nature. And I think we both go went into the uh, the working with this kid kind of in that same manner. Is that, you know, we we don't have any fear in what our, anyone can do to our bodies, but what you know, that's in Matthew ten twenty eight. Fear not, who can, uh, you know, kill the uh, kill the body, but who can kill the soul and body in hell? So. Uh, you know, that's kind of the, the outlook, I think, that we both kind of had going into the whole project. I, I, I think so, too. You know, and it's like 
I have told you in the past, I think God put us there for a reason for this kid and to hopefully, hopefully, but we won't know for a while or we may not even know in our lifetime what impact, if any, we actually have had or have not had on this kid. Um, I, I would hope that it's positive, but then we're getting back to that, that whole brain thing, you know, again. Um, what caused that individual to pull out a 12-gauge shotgun and shoot a nine-year-old boy? I have no idea, you know, but people do strange things sometimes. And that's why we have prisons. You know, we, we lock those people up and keep them away from society uh, because they can be a danger to us. Right. So kind of wrapping this up, what are your um, hopes? What are your desires for the coming year as far as we're going back to school? Obviously, we haven't been to physical school in a while. And some of those elements are going to be gone. What's your, your goal for the next year coming? Um, as far as the education is involved? Um, just to try to improve a little bit. You know, there's always those kids that you wonder why you can't really get along with them. You know, I do have one in there that, for whatever reason, hates my guts and, and takes a, an interest in, in trying to do whatever he can against me. Now, granted, you know, we had talked about that, and there's probably some outside influences and things like that, i.e. his friends or his so-called friends uh, that he won't have. But, um, you know, you, you just never know where these guys are, are coming from or why sometimes. And even with that, um, I have no ill feelings toward that student. It's just the way that, he perceives things. And so maybe there's something within me that I can change and try to make him feel a little better or something. I don't know. That's, that's going to be a little bit difficult because I think a lot of it is just because it is the way that I am. I am uh, not very giving sometimes, you know, it's like, uh, but that's how we had to deal with this other student is being like the stone face, stone wall, cold hearted kind of guy. You know, you can't smoke and joke, so to say, you know, with, with people like our student that we, we worked with, you really couldn't let a whole lot of emotion out there. And I think some of the other students were kind of used to seeing that emotion. And when they didn't see it, they would think that, Oh man, what is this guy? You know, you know, some kind of jerk or meanie or whatever the case may be. I don't know how they interpret it, but they couldn't see that's how you had to be with this other student. And there's no way that you can explain it to them. It's just the way it is. Um, so I guess basically planning, I don't know. Uh, let's see what kind of kids we got, you know, and uh, let's see what their attitude is. If, if they want to be, uh, stone Cold Steve Austin, then, you know, we can, we can be Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Undertaker or whatever and, uh, you know, play that game right back to them. If they want to be cool, then, oh, yeah, okay, well, we can be cool too, you know. Um, I, I think with, with special ed, I think you got to really be flexible uh, sometimes. And that was extremely difficult for the last couple of years with our one student. You really couldn't be all that flexible. You had to be a certain way all the time. Otherwise, you lost. And when you lose with that kid, then people could get hurt. That's, that's very true. So as wrapping this up, is there anything that you want to say to, or uh, how do you want people to remember you as far as your life and your contributions to society? What is it you want to be remembered uh, by the most? I, I think my time uh, working in, in special ed, 
um, you know, that, you know, I want him to kind of wonder a little bit, how in the world did he ever work with this student or that student or whatever? How, how come, you know, he didn't rip his head off or that student didn't rip his head off? You know, something like that. You know, I want him to kind of be wondering about that a little bit. But when they see documentaries like this and learn a little bit about me and people like you and uh, how Christian values play into all of this, how biblical teachings are so important, you know, Old and New Testament. Uh, obviously more New Testament than Old, but there, there's a lot, still a lot in the Old Testament too that you can live by. Awesome, man. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your service. Thank you for taking time out of your day to offer us this very unique perspective that you have and your unique timeline that you have. Uh, we, I definitely appreciate working with you and um, more years to come. And uh, other than that, man, uh, thank you very much. You are welcome, Pete. And and I hope whoever watches this, you know, this is this is not something to boost my ego or anything like that. If if you can watch this and learn how to do things, I think you're going to be much more successful in life. And I'm 65 years old. I, I don't say I know everything and I'm not perfect and I sin every day and things like that, you know, and I still do stupid things. Okay. But, um, but you know, if you, if you look at things in general and, and you reflect it off of the Bible, you're going to find out that the Bible thought about this stuff a long time ago before Sigmund Freud ever did. As uh, Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. So on that note, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And uh, thank you once again. I definitely learned a lot. I've been learning a lot over the course of the years we've been together. And there's so much more we could talk about, but we're going to cut it off right here. And uh, thank you once again. No problem, Pete. You're welcome.